sessions are my favorites. The ones where we get to hand select some of today's most cutting edge and impactful technologies in digital health to showcase for you. So I'm gonna kind of run briefly what you're about to see. And of course, they'll probably, um, they've probably even changed their technologies since I talked to them last. But uh, I'll try to give you a little bit of a rundown and then we'll, 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 we'll start the show. Applied VR is delivering highly effective solutions for patients in the hospital setting, <clears throat> helping them manage scary and painful experiences. Followed by Brizometer, who's using proprietary algorithm algorithms, big data, and machine learning to deliver global, real-time, and hyper-local air quality information. Deep Six AI is using sophisticated artificial intelligence to sift through mountains of unstructured patient data to swiftly discover candidates for clinical trials. Illum is using quantum dot-based diagnostics to detect a variety of common health conditions within minutes. Origin is using personal genetic analysis to deliver insights to individuals taking self-awareness to a whole new level. So let's welcome Matthew Stout from Applied VR to the stage to kick off this session. That. Is this our clicker? You're not just late on the airplane, you're late I to know the I'm stage. late for everything. <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, I want to give a shout out to David Rue. David Rue has been a, a partner of ours at Applied VR, and he's just been an amazing partner. Samsung's been an amazing partner. So Dave, I don't know if you're still out there, but uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for all the, the good support you guys give us. So typically when I come up on stage, I like to give a little uh, st anecdote story, something humorous, tap, make fun of my mama, something like that. But today, actually, I want to tell you guys, give you, start off this off with a few numbers, because there's a devastation that's going on, and we read about the headlines and all that, but sometimes I don't think people truly appreciate how devastating what's happening right now in healthcare for, for pain. One trillion. That's the cost of pain in America each and every year. That includes the total amount that's spent on pills, on mental health, that includes anxiety and depression, as well as lost days, wages, and the societal cost. 138, one, 10,032. The biggest piece of this pain area is chronic pain. That means there's 100 million chronic pain sufferers in the US. That's one third of the US population, roughly. It's over 100 million. 38 million of these are what are defined as severe chronic pain sufferers, it means they suffer from it every day. And I don't know why this is advancing. I don't know if we can go back. Uh, <clears throat> and these patients that are suffering from chronic pain every day have a very hard time getting access to it. The ratio of doctor to patient is one to 10,000 when you're just focusing on the pain piece of this. And when you're actually looking at the mental health side of this, because there's a huge comorbidity that exists between these things, it's one in something like 50,000. And this likes to get ahead. This likes to get uh, excited here. The last piece here is that we spend about $32,000 each year on this patient set. These are massive numbers. And to date, the number one line of defense that we've had are opioids. And I know this because uh, back in July, I had surgery on my lower back. It was my L5S1. And uh, the, uh, when I went in there, it was a same-day surgery, microdisectomy. They said to me, listen, Matthew, you're going to come out of this thing. You're going to start feeling a lot of pain in your life. What we want to do is, it says uh, take maybe four to six hours, but you should probably take it every four hours, maybe a little earlier than that if you want. And here's seven days uh, worth of pills. Whoops. All right, so the next numbers, 6, 15, 50. Tying it back to that seven-day I just told you about. If you take opioids for one day, you have a 6% chance of being addicted a year later. If you take opioids for one week, you have a 15% chance. And if you take opioids for a month, it's just under 50%. These are devastating numbers right now, and it is devastating America. So, and what is the result of this right now? 52,200, sorry, 58,200 and 64,070. The number on the left, 
damn, this is going fast. Number on the left is the total US casualties in the Vietnam War over all the years. The number on the right was the number of drug overdose deaths last year alone. Everybody else heard this stat yesterday. Uh, there are people overdosing from drugs, 90 people a day. This is a devastating thing. So what do we do about it? 30, 200 plus, 52. We need a new line of defense. And that line of defense is 30 years of research that have gone into virtual reality as a uh, non-pharmacological analgesic. There have been over 200 plus studies validating that VR actually works. And the last study that we did with Cedar sinai it's uh, in the process of uh, going through review, but we got a 52% reduction in pain. And that number, 52%, equates to what you see in the reduction that people get from taking opioids. And in fact, the very first study that was ever done back in the early 1990s with Hunter Hoffman, he generated, he did a test and control, and the test received opioid, uh, sorry, the test received VR control received opioids, and he measured the, both the subjective self-reported pain and the objective using an fMRI and uh, generated the exact same type of result. The problem was the technology obviously was uh, 50 to $100,000, weighed 20 pounds, blah, blah, blah. Today we're at a point where we can actually deliver something on a cell phone that's gonna be uh, more powerful than what they had back then. So now is the time that we can actually bring this to market. And we're doing that. We're, we've immersed over 5,000 patients in over 150 uh, hospitals across 40 states, and we're actually in seven countries right now trying to roll this out as that first line of defense. But what we've been doing right now has really been focusing on the acute side, which is more about opioid sparing. What gets us really excited is what we can do next. And that's, and that's about actually starting to understand what it takes to have impact on a patient and one thing we recognize through all the work that we've done is that you need to have variety. It's not one size fits all. And the second thing is it's about delivering precision. How do you actually find the right piece of content delivered to the right patient at the right time to help them with their pain? And that's where the whole idea of being able to biohack yourself comes into play. It's about combining VR with biosensors and mobile because you can't live your life in VR, obviously. And so we're actually getting ready to launch something right now that does just that, where we use your own bio data to actually drive the VR experience so that we can enhance it from a treatment perspective. We can use this as a training perspective to help you gain control and learn how to uh, develop coping skills. And then we can track that performance over time. So one, we can make it better for you as an individual, but two, we can also then figure out how we make it better you taking that data across broad population sets. Here's an example of something we're, that we were doing at a pain clinic down in Tennessee. Pa uh, the doctor sees about 1,000 patients a month. And that going breathing in and out right there, you see those uh, particles, that's her breath driving the VR experience. We, in that clinic, we uh, did some beta testing on 30 patients of the 1,000. And just two quick notes on this one. Every single one of them said they wanted to do something with it. And the second comment was uh, that 75% of them had thought about uh, committing suicide at some point in their life. All right, so now let's talk about some of the good stuff that's coming out of all this work. So we got an email outreach from a friend of this guy. We call him Teacher Bob. His friend's name have to be Bob as well. A little confusing. Uh, but uh, uh, he said, listen, we've got a, I've got a friend. He fell off the roof, broke 19 bones. He's been taking opioids every day, and he's desperate to get off. Can you help? Simple message. And all we said is, look, we don't know if this is going to help him. What we developed originally was acute pain. We want to give it to them, and just all we ask is give us something and, uh, and just let us know, did it work, good, bad, and the ugly. Hello, my name is Robert Jester. Last August, while I was working at a man's house, I, I fell from the chimney. I broke 19 bones. Uh, I had several rods put in my back and 16 bolts. And when I woke up, found myself with uh, no use of my legs and no control of anything below my waist. I didn't think a human could experience that much pain. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it. One of the weapons in my arsenal is the applied VR virtual reality. If I'm having real serious pains, a lot of times I'll strap it on. I can refocus my attention to flying on the Wright's airplane or looking at animals out on the plains or looking at farm animals. It would take my attention away from the pain. Over the past three weeks, I went with no opioids at all, none. And I have no intention. I have no intention 
of staying in this wheelchair, even though doctors say I can't. I'm gonna walk out of a conic landing someday. I'm, I'm serious, I'm going to. Now obviously this is an end of one, but this end we're multiplying every single day and helping thousands of patients, both with their acute pain and also chronic pain that we're uh, doing with the biofeedback and the integration play. And I gotta tell you, it's, it's an amazing time right now to know that we can actually do something to make an impact on these patients' lives because they're desperate and they're basically their alternatives to date have been either opioids or get cut off and have nothing in exchange. And now we have a technology and we have this, the, the capabilities to actually deliver this and make difference in their lives. So all I ask of everyone here is if anyone has any way of helping us on our mission to transform VR and bring this therapeutic pain to the marketplace in terms of making this the new first line of defense, please seek me out after this. I appreciate it, guys. Cheers. When I was invited to give this talk here today, I did what I hope every speaker does. I look at the invitation to see what I need to talk about. So the invitation uh, said that this session is about pioneering companies that are breaking yesterday's boundaries and capturing the imagination of doctors, patients, and healthcare heavyweights. So I ask myself, what does it mean to be a truly trailblazer? What are the common similarities between companies that are capturing the imagination of consumers and healthcare providers all over the world. And I think I found three common similarities. Of course, there are many more, but maybe three key similarities. One is pretty obvious, uh, making real impact in people's lives and behavior, but these are the products that we really need, that are changing the way we interact with the world, that we don't understand how we live, why we lived before having them. They're improving our health, making us maybe more relaxed, making our life easier, you name it. Products that are changing our lives. But the second thing is, is maybe less obvious. These products are redefining industry boundaries. They are stretching boundaries of, the, of, of different industries. And I, the first example is, is WeWork. They took boring cubicles, uninspiring walking places, and turned them into a vibrant, inspirational environment when, where people can learn from each other and develop even their own skills. Take a look at the recent acquisition of, of meetup.com. So they really de redefined the boundaries between office to beautiful design, to a learning experience, to a community. And I want to deep dive on a bit more about the industry and, and stretching the, the boundaries. So the obvious example is uh, Apple, but if you look at the first iPhone and how Steve Jobs presented it, he presented it as, as a three products in one. It's a phone, it's an internet, and it's music in one device. So it's stretching the boundaries of a phone. Today, it's, I think it stretched the boundaries to the maximum. It's, uh, it became uh, our lives and uh, taking all of our attention. The third example is, is Tesla. Tesla is, is much more than a car company. They are they're changing the way we consume and produce energy. It, they're cultivating uh, the sun energy with solar roof. They're storing it in our homes, powering the houses and the car. It's much more than a car. They are stretching the industry boundaries. And the third thing I found interesting in Trailblazer that it's, it's more than a money game for them. It's, truly a life mission. It's like, we're going to Mars, we're gonna change the world, it's, it's an obsession. Now there are many trailblazers, many companies that are trailblazers among us. In the next few minutes, I'll try to convince you why I hope and think a Brizometer is on its way to be a trailblazer and how companies that will tackle the environmental health problems that are existing in the world will be on the way to also become a trailblazer. So, what do you breathe right now? How's the air quality here? How's the air quality at your neighborhood where you're living? Probably don't know. And the fact that you, you don't have the knowledge on this such crucial fact that you're, you're breathing every second, we're breathing 3,000 liters of air every day, has lethal consequences. 
92%, 92% of the world's population lives with dangerous levels of air pollution. Almost 4 million people are dying from air pollution diseases every year, and it costs the economy trillions of dollars due to hospitalization, loss of working days, medication, insurance, you name it. Now, air pollution truly has no boundaries. If you think, oh, I live in a beautiful place, there is no air pollution, you're probably wrong. Pollution travels from country to country, from street to street, from, from city to city. This is a, a photo I took uh, from, from NASA, I think, in the recent uh, forest fires near LA. You can see how the pollution travels towards the, the islands in front of LA and to the ocean, but also inland. So pollution truly has no boundaries, and in most cases, air pollution is invisible. And if we can't see something for us as humans, it's very hard to tackle and do something about it. So that's why at Brizometer we believe it's time to see our air. In the, in the last two, 20 years, we revolutionized the way we consume food and water. We count calories and uh, uh, carbohydrates, fats and sugar. We believe it's time to see our air. What's going on in our, in our environment? What are the different pollutants? And that's Brizometer mission. Our mission is really to improve the, the, the lives and health of millions of people that are exposed to this bad air pollution in cities. And we're doing that by providing a very accurate and location-based air quality data all over the world. We are a completely software company. Okay? We're a data as a service. We're collecting all the data you can think about that affects our air. We're collecting traffic information, data from sensors that governments place, weather information, satellites, images. It's all about really collecting a lot of big data. And then we're, of course, validating the data, making sure it's correct. And we're implementing a very advanced uh, models, dispersion models of how the air moves using machine learning and other uh, buzzwords that I will save you from. But at the end, our outcome is, a, is, is data. The data as a service, it's an API that companies take and use in their different products that I will show you in a, in a few slides. So how air quality looks like around the world? Let's take an example of LA. On the top right, you can see the time. Red is higher pollution and yellow is moderate. Green is, of course, low. Look how air pollution changes at the course of minutes and hours in two, three days in LA. It's, it's astonishing. Air pollution is so dynamic. It moves, it travels, it changes. Traffic, fires, industry emissions, everything affects weather, of course, affects air pollution. It's very dynamic. And that's only LA. At Brizometer, we're, uh, uh, we're monitoring more than 25,000 cities in, in, in more than 67 countries at the resolution of a street. And this air quality data uh, uh, consists of many different things. We have forecasts of four days. We provide even pollen counts in the air, historical data, uh, heat maps, just the, the one you see before. Now, I, I hope you, tr you, 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 you understand what I'm leading you here, that we, are, we have the opportunity to really change people's health and behavior if we we'll just provide people this very important data. And I want to dive into two case studies or use cases of companies using our data in the health space. One company called CapCode, they have a smart inhaler that connects to an app. And once patients uh, uh, use the app, they also get alerts and notification, notifications on the air quality around them. They send them in real time, but they also send them like forecast. So they're actually doing preventive care and telling them, hey, air pollution in your area will, be, will increase, or now already is high, do something, take precautions, take medications. They also learn what triggers symptoms uh, uh, for you as an individual. And once they learn it, they can also warn you once the air pollution uh, is high based on your specific uh, uh, preferences and character characteristics. Other companies, Propeller Health, uh, they created an open database uh, that basically learns and understands the conditions that leads to asthma and COPD triggers. They used, uh, a, by create, to create this database, they use our air quality data, and now they open it to doctors and hospitals so they can take a better care of their patients. And what I'm trying to say here is that at Brizometer, and, and air quality data is 
tackling both, both the, the, the problem from both sides of the coin. We're trying to, do, to prevent uh, health problems in, pa in patients by, by empowering patients and giving them the data, but also improve the healthcare system by giving doctors more and more information about what we were exposed to, what happened to us that we don't feel so well. And we're stretching the boundaries. For example, the automotive industry is using our data. I promise you that in, the, in your next car, uh, it the, your next car will close the windows automatically, turn the HVAC on, even choose a cleanest route for you. So we're stretching the boundaries from health even to the automotive industry, even into smart home. So we're, we're, we have many partners that, that are uh, manufacturing HVAC and air purifiers. So once there's the outdoor air pollution is high, the smart home devices will take care and make sure that your health, that your home is healthy. And we're starting to matter into many more uh, industries, smart cities, cosmetic, weather, advertising, real estate, uh, and more. So what I'm trying to say here is that air quality data can make a real impact in people's life and can really stretch boundaries. And if we're coming full circle here and trying to understand what's really making companies as trailblazers, we almost forgot the most important thing, I believe, is that mission. At Brizometer, we are a very, very dedicated team that care about the air we breathe. I know each and every one of, of these people, and they really, really care about what we're doing. And I'm sure that among us, among the crowd here, there are people, because you're here, you care about people's health, and you want to improve people's lives. And I will leave you today with a question. How can we become trailblazers together? How can we improve? people's lives together, uh, feel free to reach out to me. This is my email. I'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Wout. I am the uh, co-founder and CEO of Deep6 AI. And uh, we at Deep6, we use AI to find more better matching patients for clinical trials in minutes where traditional methods take months. Now, why would we want to do that? Why bother about clinical trials? Well, they are one key enabler of innovation in healthcare in general. Um, typically, it takes the average drug or new device or new treatment in healthcare 10 to 15 years to go to market and become available to patients. Compare that, since we're at CES, with um, typical consumer devices like cell phones, right? This is what a cell phone looked like in 2005. This is what it looks like today. So basically, in the time it takes to take one drug to market, you go from the mere idea of a smartphone to 14 generations of increased sophistication in smartphones, now in the hands of more than a billion users across the world. So why is there such a difference in the velocity of innovation in consumer tech compared to healthcare? Well, one of the reasons is that every healthcare innovation right, that affects patients has to be tested in clinical trials to make sure that one, they're safe, and two, that they work. Now, that is actually a bottleneck, because if you do that for every new drug, every new device, you have to find patients to test this on, and that's where the rubber kind of hits the road. Um, if I would not be blinded by the spots, I'd ask you, has anybody here actually participated in clinical trials? I'm not going to know, because I'm not going to see your hands, but I assume not many people have, because what we've seen in recent years is that, for instance, in 2015, about 2 million U.S. patients participated in clinical trials. That is almost 4 million patients short of the recruitment goals for that year. So barely one third of all the patients that we need to test all new drugs and devices in the US actually showed up for clinical trials. As a result, nearly nine out of 10 clinical trials suffer significant delays and go over budget. Those delays on average take up to 11 months. So that's how you can see the clock ticking, right? Going to 10, 15 years before a drug hits the market. 50% of all the trial sites fail to find enough patients for their trials. Now, this affects millions of lives and costs industry billions of dollars each year. And in the meantime, we have thousands of promising new drugs that are stuck in clinical trials where only a handful of patients have access to them. Whereas if they would be available on the market, they could potentially, again, alleviate or save the lives of many, many patients. Now, why is it so hard to find patients for trials? One of the reasons is that today, the way that we try to find these patients is, plainly spoken, archaic, right? Typically, researchers either ask patients and physicians for referrals, do you know a patient like this, right? Or they ask their IT departments to run very 
rudimentary queries against the structured data fields in EMRs only. Those methods are very imprecise and they take forever. We found that by using a couple of select AI technologies actually, we can speed up the patient identification process literally from months to minutes and we can really cut down the time to recruit those patients as well. Now, how do we do this? We actually do this by reaching into all of the data for patients um, that today exist mostly in table formats, relational databases, or documents. And we actually go in depth into all the unstructured data in physician notes, pathology reports, genomics reports, everything we can get our hands on, right? Data that today cannot be found by traditional software because it's unstructured. It's just plain text or images, etc. We use different techniques to mine all of those data points and we then put patients actually in the form of a graph. So all the patient data becomes a rich multidimensional graph that has tens of thousands of data points that include symptoms, diagnosis, treatments, lifestyle choices, uh, biomics, genomic information, etc. that offers a really rich view of that patient and allows to match those patients really simply to very complex clinical trials criteria. Um, using this approach, We've been getting great results at multiple really big research sites. Um, in fact, we see that over now more than 100 trials and studies we've done, on average, our users will find patients for clinical trials, up to 100 patients per trial or something, in less than an hour. Um, one of the first PIs that we worked with was at Cedar sinai and this was a non-small cell lung cancer researcher trying to commercialize a biomarker. Uh, she had spent the previous 12 months finding and recruiting 23 patients on a trial. So 23 patients actually in 12 months, six months to identify, six months roughly to recruit them. We had never met with her, we sat down with her and we entered her criteria in our software. Less than eight minutes later, we had found 58 matching patients. She then reviewed them, actually signed them up and she said, these are all the patients I would like to recruit, including the 23 she'd found before. We've since replicated that across many other studies and every time again, we find within less than an hour, we can identify patients for trials and then free up people's time, researchers, CROs, right, to start recruiting those patients. Um, a result from that is that we get really good feedback, both from sponsors, from CROs, from actual researchers, PIs, etc. They love the usability, they love just the speed at which they can do this, and as a result, they can do many more trials much faster, which offers a significant revenue stream to their organizations. Um, with our software, basically, we help different stakeholders in the clinical trial ecosystem. We help the researchers find patients in minutes instead of months. We involve the treating physicians in the actual recruitment of the patient because we go into the EMR and into our systems to, to help them recruit patients when they're on site. We also can reach out to patients directly so we can basically offer clinical trials as an alternative to treatment or as an add-on to treatment and give them access to newer generations of drugs or treatments. And we also help sponsors, the people that are actually running the trials, um, select the sites, do feasibility studies, accelerate recruitment for their trials, and also monitor outcomes from those studies in real time, which is a, a big game changer actually for them to allow them to perform adaptive trial design. So that allows us to kind of build this overall marketplace or ecosystem where we connect all the clinical trial stakeholders into one platform driven by AI. Um, Based on this, we've had a really good 2017. We've reached out to, and um, we've deployed at a couple of really uh, premier research sites. We signed contracts with CROs, with some major sponsors. We picked up a couple of awards, which was great. We were actually named the, one of the top 100 most disruptive companies by Disruptor Daily. I don't know what we did to deserve it, but we're very grateful for that. And 2018 is, seen, is shaping up pretty good for us already. Our goal is to um, continue to increase and accelerate the speed of patient recruitment at many, many more trials and bring life-saving drugs to patients much, much faster. If you're interested to support us at admission, please um, reach out to us either via our website or our email. And if your situation should allow for it, please consider signing up for a clinical trial as well. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great CES. Bye. Good afternoon, all. Sean Parsons, founder, CEO of Alum. Fantastic to be here in beautiful Vegas. Um, I'm a critical care clinician, uh, emergency intensive care, and uh, I believe that medicine is a big complex beastie. Um, at its heart, the delivery of effective medical care uh, depends on two core decisions. The first is the right diagnosis, and the second is the best therapy. There are obviously lots of important parts, patient education, adherence, 
et cetera. But if the diagnosis is wrong or the treatment is not optimal, then the opportunity to get that patient from sick to well has been missed. I founded a loom to help get people, to create the technologies to get people from sick to well. Our vision is a world where people recover as quickly as possible from illnesses. To do that, we created the digital diagnostic tools, and we use those tools to connect to appropriate therapies, optimal therapies, to get them better as quickly as we can. Obviously, we're here because we believe technology is going to change healthcare. Technology needs to change healthcare. Uh, our piece of that puzzle, the approach that we've taken, is to create what we call a Loom Lab. Loom Lab is a smart device uh, on an Android operating system with uh, two ports to receive um, our diagnostic product, which we've created, uh, obviously with Bluetooth, Wi-Fi capabilities, and the ability to uh, use that technology to put in the hands of doctors at the coalface, family practitioners, pediatricians, emergency physicians, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, to diagnose these common illnesses and to link those diagnoses to appropriate therapy. We all obviously have an opportunity to capture that data at the same time and to use that data to better manage um, public health responses, knowing where there are illness outbreaks but also to, inform, uh, also to inform companies about where they should focus resources. The tech works by inserting our test. This is our flu test, which is um, being used in Southern Hemisphere markets at the moment. Uh, it uh, syncs with the device. There's a communication between the two. Uh, the, the user takes a swab from the patient, uh, applies it to the test, and the results available in seven minutes. Best-in-class technology uh, available um, for clinicians to use to, to uh, diagnose these illnesses. We've developed a, this technology across a range of tests. Our Group A strep product, GAS, is in clinical trial at the moment. Uh, we have others, CRP, uh, Chlamydia, RSV, in advanced development, and look forward to developing a range of these uh, products to be able to support clinicians to better identify and manage these common burdensome illnesses. We are really excited about the diagnostic capability, and we have a platform which has versatility uh, that we think makes it special. But what we're really excited about is using the digital tech of a Loom Lab to go even further, to put in the hands of clinicians the tools, these digital tools, fantastic digital tools, some of them by us and some of them by others, to help clinicians look after their patients, to educate, to diagnose, to engage. And so we have created, uh, used our technology to, to add uh, a bunch of additional features uh, from epidemiology, as you can see there on the left, to uh, medical calculators, assessing risk of uh, CVA, to patient education, engaging people about how they can uh, use inhalers, being able to connect with doctors, providing alternatives for pharmaceutical companies to engage with clinicians uh, at the patient's uh, at, the, at a time that is convenient for the clinician. And of course, uh, clinical photography, including demoscopy, to be able to take images to store these on medical records. It's all about making a clinician's life uh, easier and allowing them to focus on what they are best at, which is uh, talking to patients, engaging, using their clinical skills to get optimal results for their patients. Uh, this is being used, uh, rolled out at the moment, and we're, we're certainly very enthusiastic about it. But we think, we think there's more. We want it to do more. And I want to talk about flu for a minute. It's the middle of flu season. More people are going to die from flu this year in America than die in car accidents. The burden of flu is enormous, billions of dollars, just in the seasonal epidemic. A pandemic, of course, is magnitude, order of magnitude greater. And so uh, we felt that the world um, I felt, having lived through the swine flu pandemic at the front line, that the world could do better at diagnosing flu and then connecting the results of that diagnosis through optimal therapy. And so we created um, uh, technology to do that. In, in brief summary, the reason that the world needs to do better, and, and um, this, just to walk through a model just for a minute, about influenza transmission. So uh, an influenza organism uh, typically transmits from one person uh, to 
two others. The reproductive rate is about two. It does vary from season to season and organism to organism, but it's about, about two others. And so over multiple generations, you have this, uh, this organism spreading swiftly through a community, particularly where there is no um, prior immunity. And the point of vaccines, of course, is to um, give immunity to the, to the community to reduce the transmission. Uh, I'm certainly a big believer in vaccines, and um, uh, I get vaccinated, and so does my family. We offer the company to get vaccinated, but it's not the only tool to manage influenza. We're not winning. Flu is still a problem, despite all of the investment we place in these vaccines. If you can reduce that reproductive rate to 1.5, so instead of giving it to two people, you give it to 1.5 people through enabling early treatment, through encouraging appropriate behavioural modification, you know, don't go and see your pregnant sister, and don't send children to school, don't go to your busy workplace. Um, empower people with that information that they need to be able to make those decisions, medical certificates where appropriate. You can make an enormous burden, uh, an, an enormous dent on the burden of disease. So over those number of generations, just from going from, from 2 to 1.5, it's not going to zero. From 2 to 1.5, the ability to make a big dent on how many people in our community get flu, and therefore the number of people that have severe complications, including death, uh, goes down accordingly. We believe this, and have uh, believed this for a number of years now. We created the technology to make that possible. Um, the way that we've done that is through a, a smartphone-enabled uh, consumer diagnostic. It's a single-use uh, cartridge that plugs into a, a smartphone a uh, USB-C uh, and, uh, and Apple or Lightning. Bluetooth capability is, of course, there for the future. Uh, the user downloads the app. Uh, sorry, I'll go back a step. Would, would purchase this test through a CVS or a Walgreens. Uh, they would download the app. There is uh, the video on the, on the app to walk them through how to use it and then step-by-step -step instructions, animated instructions, to make it simple for them to, to use. They uh, walk through these steps, uh, insert, the, insert the device, step-by-step -step instructions on how to use it, screw it all together, and add the sample to the test. Wait 15 minutes for a result, and there's a great opportunity there, we believe, to educate consumers on what that result will mean for them when they receive it, and then to have a result for influenza, to know that they are, the test has been positive for influenza uh, or negative for influenza and for that consumer to then be able to access ongoing care. You know, do I need to talk to a doctor? For us to be able to facilitate that through a telemedicine service, uh, obviously third-party tele telemedicine providers in different countries, to be able to enable that, uh, that user to be able to uh, obtain the appropriate clinical information, maybe a medical certificate, potentially a script where that's, that's warranted, so that that person can have a lower transmission rate of influenza. We think this can make a dent on, this, on the burden of disease. Um, and uh, we are certainly um, looking forward to this product being ubiquitous through the community to, to enable it to achieve what we set out to do. Uh, ultimately, uh, it's about uh, the right diagnosis, and it's about connecting that diagnosis to the very best therapy and facilitating that in the easiest, most accessible way that we possibly can to achieve the best outcomes for uh, our patients and the community at large. Thank you. And um, we'll talk a little bit today about uh, what Origin does and what we've been uh, driving on a mission to do for the past four years. Um, I'll tell a little bit of a personal story. Uh, I founded Origin four years ago with my other co-founder, Kate Blanchard, because as serial entrepreneurs, we've all gone through this scenario where we see the absolute misery of trial and error medicine. So everybody's been through it. You've all had family members probably that have gone to a physician's office and you become piece of a flow chart where you're basically going down the treatment path. And so we, we decided let's start a company to revolutionize healthcare and let's go scour the marketplace in the world to see what kind of emerging technologies they were about, around for, for license. And in 2014, we stumbled upon this technology called induced pluripotent stem cell technology. Um, back in 2006, uh, Dr. Shinya Yamanaka at Kyoto University actually discovered a way to reprogram an adult human cell back to a three-day-old pluripotent state. Now think about that for a moment. We fundamentally understand enough about human cells and physiology and genetics to be able to go into the nucleus and turn an adult cell back to basically an equivalent of an embryonic stem cell. And so we called up Kyoto University and asked them, could we license this technology? 
uh, we acquired that license and started developing some um, really interesting techniques to take advantage of this technology. With these cells, you can actually take them and uh, we, we can actually take them in our laboratory and turn them into any tissue in the body. So I can pick any one of you out in the audience and we could grab you know, just a few milliliters of your blood. Um, we can reprogram the nucleus of those cells, turn them into these immortalized stem cells, and then we can grow your heart tissue or your neurons or your cartilage, uh, skin cells, your bone marrow from those, from those cells. And so we, we started this mission. We were like, let's go create a mission where we're gonna drive regenerative medicine treatments. Um, crazy thing starts happening is there are 900 of these therapies that are in the clinic today, over 900. So this is gonna happen. Um, and one of my missions is to educate the community that this technology is actually reaching out to the world and, and making sure that we can educate on, on how this can affect everyone. So um, our company uh, has three pillars to our organization. One is we have this back office research and development group that's working hard on figuring out how we develop cell therapies to regenerate tissues in human bodies. Uh, that's a Herculean effort. It's a terrifying effort when you think about biotechnology spend. Uh, it's cash hungry. There's a lot of like failures and wrecks on the, on the shores of companies that try to do this. Um, so we took a different approach. We said, let's go crowdsource human cells to build the world's largest fully consented stem cell bank on the planet. So we showed up at places like this and, and marathons and triathlons, uh, NASCAR races, rodeos, music festivals, and we asked people to donate a little bit of their blood for the common good um, and gave us a consent waiver to do that. And as we were doing this, um, some really interesting things happened. People lined up. They gathered around in, in mass quantities around our collection areas to help donate and contribute to this effort. And that was absolutely uh, heartwarming for us to see as an organization. Um, what came out of that was uh, questions, because people started asking us, hey, I'm giving you some of my blood, can you tell me something about myself? And uh, you when know, we think about it, we're like, that's a really legitimate question. Um, we think we would really love to tell people about themselves, but we can't do that from blood, because that's a diagnostic, and you know, we'd probably all be in jail today if we did that. Um, so at that time, there was this emerging trend of direct-to-consumer genetic tests. So we started asking these participants and contributors, would you be willing to you know, learn more about your genetics? And a lot of people affirmatively said yes. And we quickly developed some direct-to-consumer genetics tests. Um, we digitized those. We actually um, leveraged all of this automation, informatics, um, uh, liquid handling and high-throughput chemistry technology and biological technology that we're using for our cell reprogramming to really drive the cost down around this direct-to-consumer genetic tests. And so we launched a lot of those um, directly over the past few years, and that's what we'll really talk about the front stage part of our business today. Um, but I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of a primer on what's coming down the, the, the pipeline. Within the next five or six years, you're gonna see many of these regenerative medicine therapies come online, and uh, it's gonna look like it came out of nowhere. So um, hopefully you remember today and you remember hearing about some of this stuff. So as we think about uh, healthcare and really changing the way healthcare is um, delivered, especially around digital technologies and what's happening here today, we have to build a culture that has some you know, pretty strong ethics and guiding beliefs around this. And one of those is that third bullet point, I think is one of the most important bullet points that we can actually think about as a community together, is we think people should be in control of how their genetic information is actually used. So we don't sell genetic information. We we give people information about themselves and deliver it to them completely privately and completely for their use. Um, we, don't, we don't share that with partners. We don't share that with outside um, organizations. We don't sell that to pharmaceutical companies. Um, the, the next bullet point's really interesting. Uh, we think that trial and error medicine uh, should be a thing of the past. So you know, we have some guiding beliefs in our organization that we think are very important for us as we build a culture and, and as we kind of rally our community around figuring out how we do this. So, what happened? As we started doing this, we quickly developed one of the world's largest DNA test stores. Um, we'd be happy to show you some of this. We have two activations downstairs in the Digital Health Summit and in the Sports Innovation Lab. And um, you know, we have a fitness pro uh, product, we have a beauty product, uh, a behavior product, a nutrition product, and, um, and a superhero product. So I'll talk a little bit about how these were born. So uh, as we were gathering samples at marathons, of course there were people interested in fitness. We were also gathering samples at health and beauty events, so they were very interested in um, things that talked about skin health or skin aging. And uh, one of the most altruistic communities there are out there is the Comic-Con attendees. 
And so um, at Comic Cons, people are dressed up as superheroes, and we said, hey, I bet we can find some outlier genes that would be a really cool, interesting thing to teach people about. And we did that at a price point that's probably unbelievable to most organizations. We sell that for $29. So if you think about this, you know, just a few years ago, the Human Genome Project was billions of dollars to sequence a genome. We can deliver a product with six genes in there that tell you if you have strong bones, language learning skills, uh, speed, uh, uh, some other intelligence traits for $29. And it's a really cool icebreaker to teach people about genetics, educate them that they can learn about themselves, and it's not scary. Because this isn't the first time you're being exposed to genetics where it's a disease or you're sitting there waiting for a BRCA test to come back. I mean, those are pretty terrifying things to think about. Um, this is a way that people can share with their family and, and get to learn that technology is really cool and it's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating to learn about yourself. Over the past few months, we started releasing a bunch of mini kits. So we also have a bunch of compartmentalized mini kits for individuals to learn about whether their skin is aging or whether their metabolism is wacky or whether they're vitamin deficient. Um, and uh, if you look at mine, I'll be happy to show any of you my, uh, my embarrassing genes. Um, uh, you learn a lot about yourself. And I think it's fascinating when you have a, a user's manual to your own body. And that's how we think about this. Because when you go out and buy a car or any of these digital products you see out there in the marketplace, you're going to get a manual. And you open it up and you read about it. Um, and then you learn about how to treat that car and what kind of gas to put in it and when to change the tires. Um, but a human, you have no idea what to do. Um, I didn't actually realize that I was vitamin deficient in B6, B12, D, folates until we actually did our test in our laboratory and I looked at my own results and I went, oh my God, look at this. Um, I didn't know that I was sensitive to fats um, uh, until just a few months ago. Um, I also, uh, well, I kind of knew this about myself. I knew that I don't have the feeling full gene because if I sit in front of a pizza, I will eat the whole thing. So, um, so it's a fascinating way to learn about yourself and educate yourself about um, what makes your body you. And I think the more, it's part of our guiding beliefs, the more people know about themselves, the more they can make informed decisions about their future health, and the more they get interested in about other technologies, like that backstage technology I was telling you about, uh, about regenerative medicine. So there's some more mini kits that we're releasing. These things, um, we, we've done a really good job of making this kind of a lively, uh, lively product suite. Uh, we sell these in Latin America. Uh, we distribute these uh, in Spanish in Latin America. We have a uh, Portuguese version of these tests. We're getting ready to launch in Thailand and Thai. Uh, we have a joint venture in China, so uh, we're getting ready to launch there at the end of Q1 in China. So we've, we've really been hustling on making this uh, a, a real strong part of our business. And the most important part about this isn't that we're um, uh, commercializing genetic tests. This actually creates a sustainable business model for our biotechnology company. It's the first time ever. We accidentally stumbled on this. This business actually fuels our R&D which is really amazing for us as an organization to think about how we want to drive that regenerative medicine future. And I'll end um, with just a couple other things. It's the first time that you can actually get your DNA test delivered in the palm of your hand. We're happy to show you these things uh, live downstairs. They're fully automated and scalable. And we have a customer experience that I think is, uh, is above you know, most of the other kind of uh, tests you'll get. And I'll end with um, a product that we launched this week. And it's um, the John Lynch Game Plan product. So um, maybe if you can hit play on the video, or if I hit play, it, it might work. In my players, in myself, simple, speed, performance, toughness, resilience, spirit. And now you can look for those qualities in yourself. Were you built for power or flexibility? Can you take a hit, pop back up, or think fast on your feet? You have the right attitude. It's time to find out with the John Lynch Game Plan DNA test, part of a full line of tests from Origin. So, you know, kind of t tongue in cheek, you know, how fun is that? I mean, you can learn for the first time these traits about your body um, in, in a product that's commercially available. I, you know, I show up to the lab every day and, and I'm blown away that, you know, we're able to do this and uh, reprogram these human cells. So hopefully you'll be able to learn a little bit more and, and visit us downstairs. And I'm around for the rest of the week. So, um, Please, uh, please stop by and say hello. Thank you very much, guys.